Got it. Thank you. Uh, I first wanted to say that last month was a disconnect with my email address. I may have blathered it incorrectly or uh, hearing may have failed us, but my email is forther at comcast.net or you can send me messages through Meetup. Uh, I get all of those and read all of those. So uh, you're, you're, I'm pleased to have folks communicating with me. Thank you. Uh, don't post my email address on the clear internet. It gets harvested and I get my, the, they already get a lot of junk mail and uh, the volume increases markedly every time this happens for uh, obvious reasons. Uh, I wanted to give you folks an update quickly on the menu press books. Uh, the uh, first load of old copies of uh, Fourth Dimensions and uh, uh, Solomar conferences and things of that sort have gone to the uh, recycling. Sunnyvale has now put out a dumpster for mixed paper again. So they're back in the business of accepting mixed paper. And uh, I will be over the next month or two uh, emptying out the storage. Uh, already a few folks have spoken up about wanting uh, stuff. So I keep four copies of everything that there's four copies of. Uh, I think that the Computer History Museum has pretty much one of everything at this point. Uh, but after that, the project after that is to produce scans of uh, ASMR, which as far as I know, don't uh, appear on the web anywhere. And as far as I know, no one has performed that. Uh, intellectual property is, is pretty clearly ours or in the public domain, whichever you care to, however you care to see it. Uh, reminds me of uh, this uh, fourth encyclopedia, which appeared on various places in the web, including the web, uh, Internet Archive where they are very correct about intellectual property. And, uh, and uh, there was a fuss, a brouhaha about it, uh, which made me unhappy. Uh, intellectual property should be respected in my opinion, uh, my very strong opinion, but uh, when something is in the public, it's in the public, uh, much to the, much to the contrary of, of Disney's opinion on the subject. <laughs> All right, with that, on with the show. Uh, I did want to say that I'll need a another month or two uh, worth of rent for the storage and please to uh, entertain contributions in that regard, contract, contact me offline. You have my email address. <laughs> All right, for some time now, I've been uh, trying to get Leon Wagner and our other fourth vendors uh, if you're, if you're vending something, if you're selling something, this is, uh, we're happy to have you here in this forum, but, uh, fourth incorporated has been, uh, the premier vendor of fourth systems since the very beginning. And, uh, we're very pleased to have the principal of, uh, fourth incorporated, the head banana, big deal. Uh, he's going to tell us his title, I guess. Uh, so, Leon, introduce yourself and on with the show. Good morning. I'm actually the president of Four Think. Since 2006, when Elizabeth retired and moved to Hawaii, and she's now the busiest person I know. So, looking forward to retirement myself since I'm not busy enough now, right? <laughs> um, happy to be here. And I'm sorry it took 100 years before you were able to track me down and get me to do it. Um, my topic for today was a quick overview of our SwiftX interactive development environment. And I'm just going to show you a board that I just finished doing a port for. Okay, now tell me if you can see this. So, so I don't have multiple cameras, so we'll do this the high-tech way. Can you see it? 
Can you see that there are two LEDs blinking? Can you discern the colors? One is red and one is green. It doesn't work too well on this camera. Yes, okay. I see two, I see two blinking LEDs. Yes, we're all into LEDs. blinking LEDs today. Jurgen kicked it off and here I am with more. We colors. see the LEDs, we can't discern the colors. Yes, and I certainly can't see the colors. Who said that? Dennis, who is colorblind. Yes, said, I know Dennis is colorblind. can't see the yes. colors. <laughs> Yes, we've had many amusing things in projects over the years. Which color is blinking? And Dennis would say the brown one. Yes, something yes. like that. <laughs> okay. the right color. Um, the processor on here is an STM7, uh, sorry, STM32H745. It's a dual core CPU. It's got a Cortex M4 and a Cortex M7. And right now there's a SwiftX running a little program, demo program on each of the CPU cores and each core is blinking a different LED. So the M4 is blinking one of the LEDs and the M7 is blinking the other LED, just for fun. Um, I'm gonna do a screen share and hop over to my Windows environment and just show you what that project looks like. Originally, I told Kevin I was going to tell you how to install SwiftX, and I realized I can't really demonstrate that because that would just blow away my whole work environment. Um, so the, the short is you go to our website, download, and click install, and it really is that easy. It just installs itself. Any uh, SwiftX version that requires drivers for an interface, this one uses the Seger J-Link as the debug interface. So this little gray cable here is a JTAG interface. Um, SwiftX will always install everything you need as part of its installer. You don't have to go out and gather things up and configure various things. It just puts everything where it needs to be so it's ready to run. Uh, okay, here we go. Share screen. Uh-oh. Okay, can you see that? We can see it. All right, there's the program that each of those CPUs is running and it's just this little infinite loop. Turn on the LED, wait 250 milliseconds. Turn off the LED, wait 250 milliseconds forever. Um, that's the program. Over here in this uh, Windows Explorer window is sort of the overview of the organization of the SwiftX environment. It's a top heavy environment. All of the common source files are up here in the top level SwiftX source. And then each of these subdirectories that you can see me scroll, can you see me scrolling along these? Is for all of the processor families that are supported in SwiftX. So there are how many, about 20, 22 of them. The most popular one, what ones right now are the ARM Cortex M series. So we'll drill down into there. Bunch of different subfamilies from different vendors. The .f files in here are the source files that are specific to the ARM Cortex M, things like the uh, core uh, word set. And this processor family is the STM32H7. We'll drill down into there. And there's exactly an only one subdirectory in there. And that's for the board I just showed you, which is the Nucleo. H74, H745 ZIQ. Um, and here's the little demo program that we have open in the editor. And within there, there are two project directories, one for the M4 side and one for the M7 side. Let's go into the M4 one. Each of these is a SwiftX project and each SwiftX project has a few common components. There's uh, these files, I'll see if I can highlight them up build, config, debug, kernel, and start, and project.swx. So to launch SwiftX, you double click on project.swx, which is associated by way of the registry to the SwiftX launcher, and it brings it up and loads the right compiler and it's ready to go. The two principal load files are build.f, I'll pop it open in the editor, which just simply loads the kernel, generates, and binary output file that you can you pass off to your flash programmer for production. 
and that's it. It does not require a connection to a target. The other one is debug data, which does require a connection to a target and it establishes that connection and gets you ready to go. So we'll do that. Back in the SwiftX window, I click on the little bug icon in the, <laughs> in the toolbar and it brings up the uh, debug. So it just loaded it, established a connection via the J-Link and then this is the board actually outputting this little message to us. Uh, once we're in the environment, we have some really nice tools available to us. There's a cross-reference tool, locate, edit, which pops up your source and your editor to work with. And um, our favorite word, words, which helps you locate words and words is filtering in this version. So for example, I know I have some words that control the LED, but I haven't looked this, at this project in a long time and I wanna find them. I'll say words LED, and there they are, three of them. If I wanna see what they look like, I can click on them and locate the source. I can click on it and say edit, which will pop up in the window and show me the source. And I can also, say crossref, which will show me all the places where that particular word is used throughout the project. This is one of the very nice things about having a hosted environment where you're not trying to run the entire fourth compiler and development system and the target itself. You, uh, it seems to always to me to be a more appropriate allocation of the resources to have the resource rich side, which is the host environment, and this case of Windows, but it could just as easily be Windows or, or Linux or Mac OS, because it provides this very rich feature set to help you while you're developing. Then on the target itself, you only have the executable code for the uh, for your, your application program. While we're connected to the target via the JTAG, we can interactively uh, execute the various uh, words on the target and the host environment just pushes a copy of the, the the host stack over to the target tells it how to execute the word you want to execute and then pulls the stack back so it's a very seamless operation for example if i just want to add two numbers together that was the target doing that if i want to see how it did that I can use the built-in disassembler, another, another very nice feature to have, like how did I get there? Um, let's see what plus lead looks like. That's a little more interesting. Here's the actual source code that was compiled for turning on the LED. And you can see pretty clearly that it did a nice optimization along the way as well. So that's my overview, quick. Any questions? It's awfully quiet in here because everyone is muted. Um, yeah, why did you choose to primarily host the stack, the host, and not leave it on the target? What do you mean? Yeah, you said. Uh, um, when you start the target, you copy the target stack that resides on the host to the target, and then mm -hmm. execute, and then you pull back. Why do you do this? Why don't you just leave it on the target? Well, it, it is also on the target. You're just bringing a copy back so that you're operating with it uh, on the host. Your command line is on the host. This isn't yeah, that that's clear. Yeah. But if yeah, you the, the, if the you if you type a number, I mean, yeah. uh, then where does the number go? The number is sitting here on the host stack for now. Okay. And then when I actually perform an operation, whatever is necessary for it, gets moved to the target and back. And when you now do a dot s. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah. How so, do you? How do you differentiate whether you, with your input uh, terminal, whether you are on the host or on the target? Oh, there's a, a, a the context that you're operating in, the scope that you're operating in is either the, 
the host. Oh, I or the see target. the bottom line. Yeah. Yeah, right there. So if I said host, then I would be exclusively operating on okay. the host. So, for example, right now, if I said C, there is the uh, I386 version of plus, which is running on the host. And if I say target and I say C, there is the uh, Cortex M instruction set version or ARM. Okay. Yeah. So it's all done with scoping. Um, and credit for the design of the way the scoping works, Stephen Peltz and I designed this back in the 90s uh, while taking a walk through the green in uh, Southampton, England. We had a long walk, a long talk about how the scoping should work. We came back, whiteboarded it, and uh, we each did our own version. So that which I think still lives on in both of our product lines. Leon, is there any fourth incorporated merch? Uh, merch. T-shirts with the logo. Oh, <laughs> no, but what cups? a great idea. Ed will, uh, will help you with that, probably at a reasonable charge. Ah. He's very good yes. at, uh, at, Who does, at the logistics. Brad Nelson. Oh, awesome. He did our T-shirts. I'm wearing one today, uh, but there might be a couple of... Uh, of t-shirts. Uh, this is a Fran Lab shirt that has nothing to do with Brad, but he did the uh, SV Fig shirts the last three iterations, I believe, and uh, there'd be one or two of the rare uh, last iteration of the SV Fig uh, t-shirt available for those that are interested to contact me. Uh, yes, we did some sizes did some, are limited. We did some polo shirts one time. I think maybe Dennis still has one of those. I have one somewhere. I have a question. Um, how does, okay, so you're, you're in the target scope. Um, mm -hmm. but oh, hi, Sam. Here. Hi, oh yeah, hello. Hey, they finally updated my name. Um, <laughs> um, so you're in the target scope. You type in yes. one, two plus dot. Yeah. Um, and everything up until this point is operating on the host, in, including putting stuff up on the stack. Yeah. Um, and if the only items on the stack are uh, one, two, then surely you know that there's two numbers to transfer over. Um, yes. Yeah, it's how, just depth. But but it, but if you have more than two numbers, how does the system know that you're only transferring two numbers, or does it just copy? It doesn't. It just copies the whole stack over. Oh, okay, okay. I see. Yeah, because the, the host doesn't know a priori uh, what the target wants to consume. Right, okay. Right. Yeah, that, that's what I was getting at. I was, I was confused yeah. over that. Yeah, yeah, and it's easy, right? I mean, it's just a move. One question, so you just, I'm repeating this just so I confirm that I understand. You, you mentioned that there's a kernel, so I imagine you have a, custom kernel for every MCU that you support and then you yes yeah if you want to see that list of MCUs again it's up here at this level at the source level 60 I, HC11 HC12 HCS08 68k a lot of these are sort of ancient legacy CPUs but we still have an installed customer base so we maintain them do you support the the RP2040 is nope. that a, nope. that was a nope or a that was a no oh, okay Available for a reasonable uh, charge. Uh, the uh, well, and I and I take it it's it's in the kernel where you control the the what each core is doing and like like if I if I wanted to learn more about how do you handle synchronization between the and I and I apologize I'm I'm relatively new at learning fourth. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just, I, I know like in, in, when you're running in C, you, you have semaphores to, to lock structures so that you don't update common memory. Are, are there those types of yes, instructions? Yes, we, we have gotten release for facility variables. Okay. That sounds yeah. like really cool and is something that uh, I think deserves uh, an expanded presentation. Uh, Fourth on multiple cores has uh, long been an interest of mine. Leon, would you be willing to come back and talk to us about that? Sure. Um, 
I don't really do the application side on the multiple cores, but I can tell you what we have on the multiple cores. I mean, right now you can see that we have we have we have two we point. have these two cores running, and they're both running the same program, but each controlling a different LED. The architecture of this chip is interesting because both cores have more or less equal access to the entire array of peripherals through a great big matrix and uh, some glue that joins their buses together. Um, they can also see each other's memory, even though each has its own dedicated block of memory. So they, you could um, uh, dedicate a block of shared memory to be used for communication between the two processors. And I believe that's what the customer that we did this port for is going to do. I don't see the 68332 on us that covered on some other. You don't see a 68332. It's uh, I 60... guess 68K is. It's a, it, yeah, it's a 68K variant. Uh, the 69R1000 was a rad hard processor used a lot by NASA in the 90s, and we still maintain that. Is that United Shoe Machinery? Uh, is that who made it? Hello, okay. There, there was one. You guys send me? Hi, Ralph. Uh, any other questions about this? Uh, yes. Um, do, do, can you? We can hear you, Rolf. Okay, how much RAM uh, does the CPU, the MCU have, and how much is left after your call is loaded? Uh, do you see this little table that displays here every time I load it? So how much RAM is the bare metal CPU, not the Linux version? So it doesn't have 64K of RAM or? Much oh no, more? this one this one has uh, 256K of RAM. Okay. And it's got, I guess, half a meg of flash. It has a mega flash total and it's divided equally between the two CPUs and each one boots from the base of that one meg region. Um, another interesting characteristic of this part is because theoretically both cores would boot up at the same time, you can set a permanent option which is stored in a part of flash that you can't access directly um, to, to suppress that core from booting until it is released from hold by the other core. And that's a good way to do it. So you assign all of your initialization to one of the cores, and then you, at the end of the initialization procedure, it just releases the other core from reset and allows it to boot up and it's ready to go. That's the scheme we're using here. And this was the M4 side, the M7 side has similar usage, just different addresses. Let me ask uh, about free trials for fourth mm -hmm. incorporated products. Uh, do they expire? No, there's they... no expiration date, but the ones for the embedded systems are limited in the uh, object size. Uh, so it's in, there's enough object size, for example, these demo programs that we supply can easily be run in there and enough for you to try it out. It's not, probably not enough for you to build a full-up application. You need a license for that. I, I beg to differ. I have actually built, not, not for money, but for personal use, I have built things that did stuff, uh -huh. uh, particularly small uh, footprints. Uh, does that come with the, uh, the book? Uh, available to help file? Uh, I'm not sure what you're asking. We go to help, there's uh, in the in the demo version. Uh, mm -hmm. Is is the uh, what's the name of the book? Uh, tutorial for Fourth Incorporated. Uh, fourth steps. Programmer Sandbox. Yeah, that's it. Is it yeah, there online? I I believe that there's a doc, uh, PDF version of it. That is so cool. With, with the demo, you get a free copy of this great book. Is it still available on Amazon? Yes. As print to order? Yes. Are there any other Fourth Incorporated books on the 
on Amazon? Yes, Fourth Application Techniques is the workbook that we use when we teach classes. And it just underwent another revision um, sometime in 20, end of 2019, um, after I taught an on-site course with it, I did a whole bunch of updates to it. So it just, it, it's the new version is on Amazon right now. You can find those by way of our website. We just have a link that redirects you to Amazon to purchase them. Uh, fourth Programmer's Handbook is certainly due for an update and I've started working on it, but uh, it's been a little bit low priority. So I haven't, uh, haven't kept up with it. The principal uh, thing that drives that is that it was all based on the ANS 4th 94 standard since then, the fourth 2012 standard has been released, and it probably should be brought up to date to that, although it's not too drastic. Do you have your, your customer base for this? Do you, is, do you have like just an established customer base that you, that you service, or are, are you able to get inroads into, into new customers using embedded yeah, we get, processors? Yeah, we do get new customers from time to time, yes. Where where do you where do you see this as being a, a good choice for like if I'm a if I'm a cust if I'm developing a product um, you know why why should I use Swiftforth as opposed to Python or some other form of IDE or development environment? Uh, Swiftforth runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS, and that's not what I was showing you here. This is SwiftX just for embedded systems. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I'm trying to, you know, understand like if I, the, I'm hoping that there might be like a resurgence of fourth that, you know, cust companies might see the advantage of using fourth over other products. And I was just trying to see what your perspective on in that mm. was. There's actually a list of companies that use fourth that I've tried to keep up to date on our website. Um, and some of them are quite large companies and some of the projects that they use it on are also quite large. Uh, one of the ones that I personally participated in recently is uh, Radius Labs in North San Diego County, which does antenna controllers for satellite earth stations. I've been working on that pretty intensely for about seven years. Prior to that, we did two different similar because they were designed by the same engineer, but for two different companies, um, optical multiplexers that are used in the power industry, one of them for GE and another for a company called Schweitzer Engineering Labs up in Pullman, Washington. And those are enormous projects, absolutely enormous projects with many, 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 many thousands of installations all over the world. No, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So oh, it's hard. I have question. I have another question. Um, we all know uh, in Europe uh, the ESP force on this uh, microcontroller from China. And there, with this ESP force, it is possible to store new uh, words on the chip. So, with your current system, the, though you said it is a little bit host based, can you store text files or whatever with no. new words? So is there a sort of file system so that at the start, new words can be loaded? The, the, the file system resides on the host environment, on the Windows or Linux or Mac OS environment, and is fully available. And the, one of the other benefits of keeping your file system on your host is that you can keep it under version control. We use Git. We used to use CVS. We have customers who use Subversion. Uh, there's one more. I can't think of the name. Um, so those are all the reasons that you keep the files on your host, not on your target. I, you know, keeping all that stuff on the target is sort of the 1980 way of doing it. And since we have these very rich host environments and all of these wonderful tools available to us that would run on the host and we can still keep the target very lightweight, that's always my first choice. We do have a target resident interpreter that you can turn on as long as you have a way to access it for field debugging and testing. And I put that in every project that I touch that has some kind of interface to it that would let me get a terminal into it. 
Uh, now the problem is if uh, the if there are some text files with new force code and it's a real application, so that uh, not without user interaction. So if it's installed as uh, as application, as, as kiosk uh, software for a POS system for for sales yeah. system like this, uh, then uh, I'm also writing uh, a force system. Uh, for private use, currently my way is that I say I must share all force words in C and write it down the code in C. So I must not or cannot create new words which are stored on the bare metal controllers without any file system. Let's say the M0 uh, series eval boards of ST. Or the, the right. all, all of these uh, targets, including the one I just showed you, have no file system on them. It's, yes. it's bare metal but, just running for it. But uh, but if there is an application, uh, the force is uh, either my is open source, yours is uh, with IP license, with license, uh, then the application code must somewhere, somebody compile on the system. So if there is a reset, I cannot load from the file system of uh, the, the Windows or Linux was because it is not there, it's in the application. So the application is some at some point uh, separated from the development system. So if there is a reset, it must reload all the new words. Or do you-, do you None of these boards, none of these boards load from source. It's, they're just running the object code. I think you're describing a different problem. Yeah, okay. Oh, so uh, you so you finally compile everything on the host. And then everything is compiled on the host, and all that ah, gets pushed yeah. over is the binary executable, which is tiny, really, you know, okay. compared to the to the volume of the source code. Yeah. Okay. With that, I'd like to say: Is there anybody that has one last desperate question? <laughs> Good timing because I was supposed to leave at 10. <laughs> All right. Off with you then. Thank you so much, Leon. We'll have to drive so you much. back here sooner. Yeah. Than, nice to see uh, everyone.